workshop officer in order to help put this event together. And I can just say that I'm so proud of seeing all of the presenters, all of the poster makers, the work that's gone into their projects, and just to see how much they improved over the course of our very few practices. Uh, so I just want to let you know that you guys are seeing a lot of really hard work today, and we can be proud of it as Wolfson students. Uh, so today with this session, I think we're really looking at a lot of issues that affect all of us, things like journalism and ethics, things like climate change and justice, mental health, even religion and social media. And even though they're things that affect us and maybe sometimes we think, a lot, think about a lot, uh, all of the presenters today have really gone about unique creative ways of investigating these things that are just kind of constants in the background of our lives. Uh, and so without further ado, I want to introduce our first speaker, Anna Dikova, who's going to be talking about journalism and ethics in Russia. So welcome up, Anna. Coming. My name is Anna Dikova, and I'm going to talk today about uh, Russian pre-war journalism. I started uh, to work on this topic because I wanted to understand a pretty simple thing. I wanted to understand how pro-government journalists maintain their moral integrity in a situation where they have to basically lie all the time. Uh, and my main point is that because of constant censorship, journalists have developed a new professional ethics in which the main value is loyalty, not objectivity as it used to be. Within this new ethics, self-censorship has become a virtue rather than a necessary evil. Um, I did this study before the war. Uh, so it is more of an insight uh, into how the war became possible than a reflection of how things are today. Uh, and I probably wouldn't do this uh, now. I believe that uh, to study people, you have to have some sort of sympathy to, to them. And right now, I can't have sympathy for prostate pro journalists at all for pretty obvious reasons. Um, but before we get to the core of my argument, uh, let me say some words about my methodology. I have conducted uh, six months of participant observation uh, as an intern in the Russian office of Russia Today. Uh, several times a week I would contact my supervisor there. I also regularly wrote articles under his guidance. Regrettably, my contacts with the other journalists was uh, rare uh, and occasional because my field work coincided with COVID pandemics uh, and the office was working remotely. Having finished participant observation, I conducted 23 uh, interviews uh, with journalists from various state-supported media. Um, I want to give some historical background on the freedom of the press in Russia to see the contradiction between, between the country's constitutional protection of free speech and media freedom and the reality of increasing pressure, pressure on journalists and media outlets. Uh, ironically, uh, Russian constitution directly prohibits censorship and enshrines freedom of speech and freedom of the media. Uh, but since 2014, uh, when Russia annexed Crimea, media censorship has increased dramatically. There are a few cases of the whole editorial staff on a, of, independent, of an independent media being replaced. Uh, laws were passed to quickly block websites. Journalists began to be prosecuted under laws on extremism and disclosure of state secrets. Foreign agent status was increased legally, making it difficult to work. Uh, if all this did not help, uh, there is also a less legal practice of planting drugs on a person and putting them uh, in jail as a drug trafficker. As a result of these pressures, by 2020, uh, the year of my research, almost all media outlets in Russia either did not cover anything politically sensitive or were, or were controlled by the state. Um, Let's move on to the ethnographic details of censorship practices. Russian state-controlled media operates under explicit and implicit rules and regulations, including talking points, temniki, um, orders, raznaryadki, uh, and given perspective, zadane ugul padacha. These reg regulations are distributed in informal work communication, uh, both via emails and work chats, and thus oral instructions. Uh, instructions may include uh, the list of recommended and prohibited words, the use of quotation marks to show the position of the media, 
the order uh, in which points of view should be presented, and the position of the media. Um, let me dwell a bit on Zadni Ugul Padachi, given perspective. It's my favorite, and I have also a pretty picturesque example of this one. Uh, this comp co concept comprises instruction as uh, to whether particular events should be covered positively, negatively, or neutrally. Um, I should read out uh, what one of my informants told me about Russian media's response uh, on the attack of Malaysia Airlines flight uh, in eastern Ukraine. Um, in the summer of 2014, when the Boeing crashed, every piece of material that was somehow connected with Boeing had to begin with a statement of Russia's position. We did not shoot down the Boeing, and the pro-Russian rebels most likely did not shoot it down, and God, and, and God knows who shot it down, most likely the Ukrainians. It had to be written down like a mantra. We didn't shoot it down, we didn't see it, we didn't hear it, even if the Boeing has not, had nothing to do with uh, the material if it was the text about humanitarian aid uh, to the Donbass, for example, and Boeing was mentioned there once. It was still obligatory to write it at the very beginning of the article. Uh, we were not the only ones. The other state media did so too. Everyone knew it looked stupid, but they wrote it anyway. Uh, you can see in this man's direct speech uh, that for him it is not only immoral to work this way, but uh, also professionally humiliating. And this is because uh, objectivity as a part of professional ethics has been important for Russian journalists, but it's difficult to adhere to under conditions uh, of censorship. As Claudia Melarda, a media researcher, summarized, uh, journalists worldwide tend to endorse professional roles and values that emphasize neutrality, objectivity, and the scrutiny of official behavior. behavior. The pursuit of these values is made possible by the belief that a truthful representation of reality is achievable. Um, and this is the ethic that are taught in universities uh, in Russia. Uh, this is, uh, these are the values with which people used to choose to become journalists. And this is the ethics uh, that those who left the profession in 2014 uh, told me about. But those who were still employed in state media uh, when I interviewed them uh, were skeptical on the, of the ideas of truth and objectivity. They considered the truth to be relative and objectivity to be fundamentally unattainable. They uh, regarded the belief in the possibility of objective journalism as naive and idealistic. Uh, so journalists look for other values and other ethics. I'll show you a quote where you can see the conflict between the old ethics and the ethics they, they found. Mm. Um, I once went to the Strategic Missile Forces Unit. Putin reported that we have 86% of modern warfare, but there is no toilet at this unit. There is simply no toilet. How's that? I could have written about it. Not an RT, of course, but at another outlet. However, I did not. I understand that I, I'm somewhat biased, but here the moral component is more important than this callous compliance with journalistic standards. This is Sakei, a journalist for Russia Today, telling that respecting the interest of his sources is more important to him than the accuracy of coverage. Uh, when asked what journalistic ethics means to them, uh, my informants primarily talk about respecting the interest of their sources, and this is crucial uh, to my point. Here the notions of objective and ethical are conceived as confronting each other. You, see, you can see the moral component and callous compliance with journalistic standards. Uh, these were two opposing poles. One can be either moral or objective. The moral aspect here is one's loyalty towards one's sources, one's accordance with their interest. In this picture, objectivity has nothing whatsoever to do with ethics. Objectivity is a part of callous uh, journalistic standards that are strictly opposed to ethics. Um, state censorship in Russia is felt to limit individuals' freedom and agency, but self-censorship is becoming part of, uh, ethical, of ethical professional behavior. Because of censorship, journalists uh, constantly exist in a situation uh, where, where they are coerced. Self-censorship helps to avoid this feeling of coercion because you were not forced, you decided for yourself to not to say some stuff. And my interlocutors talked about self-censorship both when I asked them about restricting freedom of speech that they, they faced and when I asked them about ethics, 
self-censorship, which allows to uh, protect a source or to keep loyalty, becomes the practice of a good journalist and a good professional. Objectivity is perceived as unattainable. Lying becomes an integral part of the profession and as an, oper uh, as an operational necessity ceases to be unethical. As one of my interlocutors, television channel employee told me, a journalist who says that they never lie and never get up over themselves is just a worse liar because we all lie. So to sum up, uh, my question was how employees of state-supported media maintain moral integrity and found uh, uh, that censorship violates the sense of agency. Journalists feel pressured, but self-censorship removes the sense of external pressure and returns the sense of agent agency. The ethics of objectivity is rejected as unachievable and replaced by a functioning ethics of loyalty. In order to maintain sanity, these people had to change the coordinate system. Uh, thank you. We'll now have a few moments for questions. So it looks like there's some up here. Hi, thank you so much for the, the presentation. I was just interested with regards to the ongoing war in Ukraine, how journalists find their role in mediating the conflict when um, soldiers are also reporting experiences, like not having access to modern warfare and um, sort of, yeah, the, the, the conflict is not turning out the way that the Russian state propaganda is sort of making it out to be. So how do sort of journalists conflict with the actual experiences of soldiers who are reporting on um, the sort of the relative failures of the campaign so far? Thank you for the question. Um, it interested me too, but this is a pre-war study. Uh, so I don't know how they feel it today. I can speculate, I can uh, uh, make hypotheses uh, based on what I know. And based on what I know, I can, uh, I could say that they probably perceive themselves as uh, a protector, uh, protector, protectors of the state. So if they have to say something which doesn't really uh, reflects reality, uh, how they know about this. Uh, they would see it as like n something which has to be done because there is a thing which is way more important than reality. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, I hope I'm not taking you too far beyond uh, your academic work. What, what interests me always in these situations is that you get this dichotomy between the West, in inverted commas, and Russia, and Putin likes to talk about uh, the West. Now, very recently, uh, we've had news that uh, Fox News in the United States has had to admit that it was deliberately lying or one of its chief presenters was deliberately lying about uh, Trump's defeat in the election. And it strikes me that whereas in Russia we've got a government that's controlling all the media, in another society such as the United States, we've got different elements within that society, Fox News on the one hand, CNN on the other hand that also have their own agendas, and in certain cases, and in the case of Fox News, they have deliberately lied. Have you got any comment to make about the contrast between the news we receive in, in inverted commas, the West, and the news that's propagated in Russia? No, I don't feel that, that I can comment on this because I, I'm not really aware of uh, American system of um, news and journalism. Thank you. All right, thank you. We have time for one more question. Hey, thank you for this very interesting and very relevant, especially these days, lecture. Like it's some really tough topics, I can imagine. Slightly continuing the previous line of questions concerned about, about the relation between Russia and the West, it's where 
you talked about how there's this self-censorship which removes the need for like that pressure from the state. So is there, as far as you know, any sort of, say, countermeasures or counter pressure that is perhaps at least being tried to be employed or used by, say, external actors such as the West in Russian journalism? And would those sort of things have any sort of effect? Because we do still sometimes see whistleblowers and dissenters and so on, where obviously I'd hope also that they do that just out of their own morality and good choice. Um, but I was wondering how much is there, if any, sort of external influences now affecting them? Uh, could you please repeat the question? Yes. Um, have any external influences or pressures used by the West on Russian journalists to kind of try and act as a counterbalance to the Russian state's pressures on them? I like in uh, external forces, which kind of external forces? Sorry. Not as well. Um, I mean, it is a bit vague, I guess. Any sort of perhaps pressure to, say, report on things in a certain manner versus, say, perhaps what might be socially accepted within Russia. Yeah, of course, there is uh, a lot of uh, instructions on how various uh, events should be covered and should not be covered. And there is uh, uh, some uh, uh, point of... I would say freedom, or okay, flexibility on covering on covering some issues. And uh, uh, the question you were talking about, probably since it's not like crucial point for Russian uh, current agenda, they could be covered with uh, more flexibility than, uh, for example, some uh, more closely war-related stuff. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Okay, next we will be hearing from Anua Abikamensa, uh, who will be talking about the relationship between decolonization and climate change um, and giving her thoughts um, on the developments in recent climate conferences worldwide. Um, so, without further ado, I want to welcome her to the stage. Hi, everyone. Um, if please, firstly, excuse me for being a bit jittery. I literally submitted my dissertation, which is this, like six hours ago, so I'm running on very little sleep. <laughs> um, but I'm really happy to be here and uh, hopefully um, this will all make sense. There are a lot of words up here, but I will explain them all. Um, so hi, my name is Anawa Abikamensa. I'm a final year undergraduate student and I study human, social and political sciences. So politics and a bunch of ologies. Um, and I will be presenting my research project, which is towards the decolonial politics of receptive generosity, the international gifting order and the world making of the climate justice movement. Uh, like I said, if none of that makes any sense, hopefully it will in about 10 minutes time. So within the last decade, um, climate change has come to the forefront of the public consciousness and has risen to the top of the political agenda. As the climate justice stream of the movement has gained momentum, the direct causality between colonialism and climate change has been noted and actively discussed within the movement and scholarly literature. So we can see here that there's a reference to CO2 and colonialism. For example, Bambra and Newell note that since colonial extraction remains integral to capitalist expansion, colonialism, capitalism, and catastrophic climate change are structurally linked. However, while scholarship has increasingly analyzed the direct causality between colonialism and the climate crisis, it has neglected to explore how a focus on the Anthropocene, that is the human dominated geological epoch, exposes new understandings of colonialism. So why is this important? Well, if European colonial expansion is a direct cause of the climate crisis, which now threatens the whole of humanity, then colonialism can no longer be understood as a force which only affects colonized populations. It must be reconceptualized as an all-encompassing force. So as Burke et al note, centering the planet in international relations theory and analysis exposes this condition of being entangled or being singular plural 
What this means is that the pluralized political... Ooh, sorry. There we go. What this means is that the pluralized political units that tend to comprise the primary units of analysis in IR are simultaneously singular in their conception. So what this means is that on one hand, we have to think about nation states, but we also have to think about the world in our conceptualizations. And when it comes to colonialism and decolonization, we need to think about the global north, global south, colonizer, colonized dichotomy, but we also need to think about the singular unit that is the world or humanity. So this necessitates two questions. How do conceptualizations of colonialism and global coloniality change when we consider entanglement? And how do conceptualizations of decolonization change when we consider entanglement? Sorry, I've lost the mouse. Um, to answer this question, um, we explore the discourses that are emerging from indigenous activists within the climate justice movement. And so I analyze the addresses of five indigenous activists across COP25, COP26 and COP27. These are from left to right, Hindu Umaru Ibrahim from Mbororo, the Sahel, Chad. Um, up there we have Chai Surui, she's from Rondonia, um, the Amazon in Brazil. Here we have India Logan Riley. Um, she is from Kati Kahanunu in the North Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand. And here we have Kira Sherwood O'Regan, who is from the South Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand. There's also an additional um, representat uh, representative that I, I looked at, but unfortunately I don't have their, um, their picture here. So the first thing we see is that while colonialism is presented as a direct assault on indigenous lands with devastating outcomes for that land and indigenous peoples, it's also highlighted that indigenous peoples are facing the brunt of climate change impacts. And climate change and colonialism is thus presented as this process which encompasses the whole world, as we see here. peoples extend beyond just what's happening in developing nations and in forest ecosystems to include what's also happening in developed nations and all ecosystems across the globe. So to summarize, she effectively says that in, in the case of climate change, all of our fates are intertwined. Global coloniality is also presented as a structure through which indigenous knowledge is excluded from the world community by Western governments. The activists then condemn the land theft of colonialism, but they also condemn the overrepresentation of Global North knowledge and solutions while affirming their own culture and their own contributions. We are experts on climate. We are the kaitiaki, the stewards of nature. We know the legitimacy of our voices, and it's about time that you recognize it too. However, ignoring and neglecting these contributions is not presented as primarily being damaging to indigenous peoples, but it is presented as being damaging to the global north, to Western governments, and to the world community. When you silence us, you deny yourselves learning from our ways and you continue to sideline those who have real solutions for all communities. Thus, colonialism and global coloniality are understood outside of their dichotomous structure here, and we witness two key conceptual shifts. Firstly, while colonialism is, of course, the theft of indigenous land, as well as the colonial distribution of climate vulnerability, it's also a process which has damaged all land, the whole earth, and unfortunately now threatens all people. We see then that colonialism is presented as a self-detrimental force. Thus, as Fanon highlights in his A Dying Colonialism, when we consider entanglement, the global north becomes both the organizer and a victim of a system that has choked him. It's a quotation there. 
The second key takeaway is that once we consider entanglement, global coloniality is shown to function as a sort of monopolized gift economy, or what I refer to as the international gifting order. And what this basically means is that the activists highlight that the global north has this monopoly over the production of universal knowledge and a monopoly over who can contribute, help, or gift to the world. This order is also presented as self-detrimental. Decolonization, then, is conceptualized as the restoration of land rights. However, this is not only a restorative act for indigenous peoples, but is a restorative act for the world in combating climate change. And that's why we advocate so strongly for consistency in upholding indigenous peoples' rights as effective climate change strategies in all mechanisms and in all discussions that are, uh, are currently um, being undertaken here at COP and throughout the UN system. Furthermore, decolonization is also the inclusion of indigenous climate science on the global stage and for the service of the whole world. This is enacted through a process of knowledge exchange and an active process of learning from indigenous peoples and respecting and following indigenous leadership. I come to this leaders event on forest and land with a very simple message. We have the map. We know where we are going and we know how to drive. So give us the key. I come to this Um, and because I think this is a very good summary of everything that's been said here, this is Logan Riley speaking for about 30 seconds to this point. And last but not least, land back, oceans back. This is all part of following indigenous leadership. This is what keeping warming below 1.5 degrees looks like. This is an invitation to you. This COP, learn our histories, listen to our stories, Honor our knowledge and get in line or get out of the way. Kia ora. Thank you. Therefore, we see a very different approach to what constitutes decolonization. As the indigenous activists insist on their histories and knowledge being learnt and upheld, they appear to be advocating for what Maldonado Torres calls a decolonial politics of receptive generosity. And this is a term borrowed from Roman Coles, and this describes an ethics committed not merely to giving to others, but to receiving from them as well. Such an ethics depends upon an attitude of vulnerable openness to learning from others, not merely masterfully teaching them. This process achieves not only justice for indigenous peoples in the global south, but is presented as necessary for the survival of the world. Decolonization then is characterized as a post-colonial cosmopolitanism, and this is a form of world making. So thank you for listening, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Anwar, for that presentation. You're Absolutely welcome, Ed. Amazing. Um, so, obviously, as you probably know, I've just come back from Ghana, and this is something I've been looking at um, personally as well. But do you get a sense that um, this decolonization can actually happen and be sustained? Is there hope? Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Um, I think a good way of thinking about that is that there's a bunch of literature that obviously I couldn't include here, but there is a theory that cosmopolitanism is um, an imagined community of global risk. And what that means is that another element of looking at this is that we come together and work together and we mobilize our individual identities and cultures and perspectives in the face of a global risk. Climate change is one of those, but we could have looked at COVID-19 as another example. Um, and COVID-19 is a good example because actually we saw a lot of examples of what people called south to north humanitarianism, where we had doctors from Somalia going to Italy um, and we had um, a lot of developments in terms of um, 
how to restrict movement, etc., coming from the global south and then being emulated in the global north. Now, while that wasn't always completely um, acknowledged and that wasn't always highly and heavily reported, it is something that took place. Um, and so this idea of receptive generosity, I think, comes to the fore in the face of these global risks. And I think we see that um, different cultures and identities and um, political subjectivities are mobilized in the face of these things. So I think it's possible. I think it does depend on a level of humility, which is what kind of this is all about. Um, but I think when push comes to shove, it happens. Unfortunately, we'd love it to not come to that point. <laughs> Hi, Anna. Thanks for that really excellent presentation. I was wondering about, and I think you've probably thought about this a little bit, about how this sort of um, ideal of a new mode of working on a global stage may parallel or maybe more often chafe against some of the more formalized mechanisms for thinking about sustainable international development in particular. So I'm thinking of the UN SDGs and things like that. Yeah. So I wondered if you might comment on the applicability of what you're doing here and whether you think it jives well with the sort of current regime. Um, I'm going to say a strong no. <laughs> um, and the reason I say that, I think, is because of what you've already alluded to. Like, if we think about the sustainable development goals, they are based around this very Eurocentric idea of what sustainability looks like. It's based around this Eurocentric idea of what development is and the fact that development is considered to be required. Um, and I think, in that sense, a lot of what is communicated here is that different epistems approach things differently and not only do they approach things differently in their own contexts but a lot of the things that are different can be uh, can be applied more widely um, and I think for instance when we talk about things like diversity and multiculturalism what we tend to be talking about is everyone's individual right to stay in their lane and do their thing in their space and what we don't ever really consider is that we can learn from other people's experiences we can learn from other cultures that we have unfortunately been kind of taught are, are less important and no less than the West does. Um, and that's why I think it does come back to this idea of humility and just being open to learning what you don't already know. Um, and so I don't think we're really on track for that, but I think that's why looking at things like this is so interesting because it is being put into the global arena. People are standing on stages and saying these things. Um, and that's why it's important that we do research and have things like this that kind of bring them to the fore and bring them to, um, to attention. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, just responding to your use of Fanon, and um, who sort of defines violence as being a very constitutive part of the process of decolonization. Yeah. Um, essentially, my question is, um, where's the space for protest and potentially violent protest that does transgress against kind of like human yeah. welfare as well in order to make, um, sort of make profound and make clear the need for quite emergent sort of emergency action and yeah. for the West to listen to these sort of non-Western forms of um, climate justice. Yeah, um, I love Fanon. I love Fanon because I love that he's very nuanced and that there is so much in his work. So on one hand, we're talking about violence and you could argue that that's completely contradictory with this idea of like giving and sharing. But I do actually think they go hand in hand. Um, and I think, I think protest is a very important and necessary tool for one attention. I think disruption is a very important way of, of getting things on the agenda. Um, and it's worth noting that we don't get to have these conversations until people protest. Um, it's taken protests and movements at previous COPs to get indigenous peoples the spaces that they've needed here. Um, and it continues to take those movements in order to have these conversations. Um, I don't think that protest is necessarily a uh, a route to conversation, but I do think it's worth acknowledging that actually sometimes in order to get in a room and have a conversation with the people that you need to talk to, you've got to scream outside the room first. <laughs> um, and I think this is a, a good example of that. And so I absolutely think there is room for protest and um, I absolutely endorse and love me a good protest. So, uh, yeah. <laughs>
we will now move on to our third speaker for this session, Susie Triffitt, who found a very good use of her time on social media that I wish um, I could emulate, and you'll see, see, soon see what I'm talking about. Um, so Susie, the floor is yours. Hey guys, what a talk to follow. I think it's the first thing to say. Um, thank you so much for coming to my TikTok. <clears throat> it's, it's awesome to see you here. Um, my name is Susie and I'm a PhD candidate based at the Faculty of Divinity. I'm currently undertaking a project based across theology and one of the ologies, anthropology, where I'm studying people who became Christian during the pandemic. I'm doing my research through fieldwork, which means that next year I will not be based in Cambridge, but I'll intrepidly be moving to Bradford in Yorkshire. <laughs> Shouldn't laugh. Um, <laughs> to work with the churches and Christian community there. So let's start this talk with Clara. As expected, when I dreamed of undertaking a PhD in Cambridge, I seemed to be spending a large amount of my day perusing Christian TikTok. And Clara is my favorite Christian influencer. As you can see from, oh, you can't, oh, oopsie, never mind. Um, as you can, well, you could have seen from her description, Clara posts out Jesus content and me doing me. So let's look at a recent TikTok, which is here. Clara takes a selfie in the bathroom. If I had to speak about love, she asks, and then she shows a Jesus cartoon of Jesus hugging someone. This and videos filmed in her car are classic Clara content. So what does my new mild addiction to TikTok then have to do with the question of this talk? Did the pandemic enable people to explore religious belief? Well, everything in a way. Um, throughout my MPhil and my PhD research, I've kept coming across people who have come to belief during the pandemic through their computers and phones. I'm gonna swiftly take you on the journey. I'm just starting to explore. Bear with me, I haven't finished and got to the destination yet, and I'm still kind of working this out. So where it started, um, during the summer of 2021, I engaged in largely online fieldwork on the Christian Alpha course. Has anyone heard of the Christian Alpha course? Yeah. So yeah, sorry, I need to calm down. I love, love Alpha. Um, Alpha is an evangelistic Christian course seeking to introduce and unpick the basics of Christianity. It does this through a series of videos, which are then followed by discussions within a small group. It's important to note that this course is for those without a faith, as well as those with a faith. It can serve as an introduction to Christianity, as well as a spiritual refresher for believers who are struggling with their faith. Since its conception in the 70s, it's grown massively and has been undertaken by over 30 million people in over 100 countries and in more than 100 languages. So my interest in Alpha was peaked when I read a news report that Alpha's attendance had tripled during the COVID lockdowns. Historically, Alpha had always been in person, getting to know each other over a meal before discussing God and the meaning of life. Alpha had insisted on not going online until the pandemic, when they were forced to hold sessions over Zoom. When they did this, their attendance exploded and they haven't looked back. So I began my research fascinated in doing fieldwork on believers and non-believers engagement and suffering. Sorry, that's a bit depressing. Um, I'm a trained theologian, philosopher, and anthropologist. Suffering and God presented a tension between my theology training that told me the problem of evil was the main reason people did not believe in God, and my anthropology training that told me that suffering led people in need of comfort to God. There was an obvious tension between these two ideas, um, from my dis discipline, and it seemed the pandemic offered the perfect moment of encounter to test them. Did Alpha's growth confirm that people sought out religion in times of trouble? The short answer from my fieldwork was no. Um, throughout my interviews, experience of suffering was not cited as the reason why people had done Alpha. Prima facie, one might think this was caused by the awkwardness of talking about suffering. However, I readily spoke to people about their trials, often made easier by my openness to discuss the illness and death of my own mother to leukemia in 2018. But their reasons for coming to Alpha were different and awesome. Um, it seemed for the majority of people I spoke to that they were interested in religion or exploring their faith. I term these people belief curious, that's my word, um, before the pandemic. 
The pandemic brought them out of the woodwork. First of all, because online alpha was more practical than in-person alpha. It took less time, people had more time. It was open to those who could not travel or had care responsibilities. Furthermore, people were no longer bound to engage in Alpha at their local church. They could shop around, even attend an Alpha in another country. For example, I spoke to a woman who attended a session in Lancaster from Germany. On top of all this, each Alpha itself was no longer bound to marketing only to a 10 mile radius around its physical location. Now people can invite friends to Alpha wherever they were based. Beyond this unsexy but realistic answer, there was another reason why people attended Alpha online. The online environment allowed the belief curious to explore faith in private, away from the social gaze in a safe space with a socially acceptable exit. Those who have previous been, previously been afraid of being known or seen to attend as a religious or Christian evangelistic group did so privately from their own homes. No one would know. Further, if it was clearly not for them, they knew, they knew they could click the exit button, write a short email to the organizer saying the internet wasn't up to these sessions and wipe their hands of all this God stuff. I wish you, felt, you probably feel like that right now. Um, scratch that itch with no social consequences. So I was, I was in awe of this answer <laughs> um, as a Christian myself and as a researcher. It gave me a real need to know more about how the private digital spaces enabled by the pandemic had facilitated belief. And that brings me to TikTok. <laughs> so hands up who knows about TikTok. Yay. <laughs> um, I felt that question might have more response than Alpha. Hannah Laurie, don't worry, I'm explaining what it is. Um, however, for those allergic to social media like myself, um, TikTok was founded in 2016 as a collaboration of the Chinese Duyuan and Musical.ly by the Chinese company ByteDance. It hosts user-submitted vertical videos, which can be 15 seconds, 30 seconds, or two minutes long. It's currently been downloaded by about two billion people, so roughly a quarter of the world's population. I'm not gonna unpack the whole of TikTok and its current geopolitical significance for you, but an important thing about TikTok I need you to know is that unlike other platforms like Facebook or Instagram, the majority of content the viewer sees is from sources they are not following, but TikTok thinks they would like to view. Because TikTok shows people things they're not looking for, it is fascinating in the context of studying evangelism. Religious content is shown to non-religious people on TikTok. What could this mean during the pandemic where TikTok grew massively and people have more time and privacy. So it's time to meet um, Bea, sorry, this isn't Bea. Um, <laughs> Bea is 19 and I met her about six months ago. She sat in front of me, eyes keen and fidgeting and told me about her conversion to evangelical Christianity over TikTok. She laughed. My parents thought I joined a cult. I mean, who hurt their generation? Um, <laughs> She told me about the TikToks, which explained the Bible to her for the first time. The short length suiting her autism and short attention span. TikTok videos explained to her that Jesus died for, her, for our sins. Through TikTok, she found a community of young people. She joined online worship groups with 900 other people from across the world, where they would listen to music and a sermon before going to breakout rooms to discuss. She discussed social issues with the group, she told me that she now wanted to find a Christian husband to be able to take children to church and pray together. For Beatrice, the privacy of her bedroom and the long lockdown hours gave her the time to explore Christianity on TikTok. She became part of a community she wasn't looking for. And like my sort of alpha, so my alpha interlocutors were belief curious before the pandemic, before alpha, while TikTok made Beatrice belief curious and ultimately a Christian. So how did TikTok have this power? Um, yes, it had this power because of the pandemic, time, privacy, blah, blah. Um, the access, the digital platform provider, but there also seems to be something else about these TikToks. In a paper I'm currently writing, I'll argue that the gaps and absences between the viewer, the content creator, and the algorithm offers space for religious experience. Let me briefly explain this before I let you go. After meeting Beatrice, I met Henry. This is one of his TikTok reels. Um, Henry is a Christian content creator 
working freelancers for churches and charities all over the world. I asked him about TikToks and Reels. He told me, in 2023, vertical video is the most important content that exists for reaching people. I make Reels that are evangelistic to reach people who are not Christian, who just like creative content, who in that idea of what church is wouldn't expect to see stuff like this. And I make devotional content for Christians. When speaking to Henry, I wanted to know how much strategy was put into these reels by their creators. I asked Henry about this and he laughed. Before starting a video, there are a few things I ask. What is the platform, audience? These need different strategies. You need to make sure they're hooked in the first half second. You need something beautiful, cutting, which has movement and builds suspense. The conclusion I want you to draw from this is that the religious content that Beatrice was watching was incredibly curated by its creators. It was curated to be gripping, beautiful and touching, to hook her in the first, first half second, curated to make her feel something or even be a medium for the Holy Spirit. The last member of this tale, and then I promise I'll be quiet, um, is the TikTok algorithm. The mysterious algorithm which has freaked out users for knowing exactly what they want and need to watch. It's what makes TikTok addictive. In my current research, I'm investigating the religious experience that come about in those like Bear, who, sh who are shown incredibly emotionally curated Christian content by the algorithm and how this makes them feel. Some feel these TikToks have been sent to them. And the gaps between these agents create space for that wow factor or that God factor. It is not God of the gaps, it's gaps filled with God. Did God send me this TikTok today? And it's not my role as researcher to say he didn't. In rough conclusions on an ongoing project, the pandemic has enabled people see, um, <laughs> to explore religious belief because it has given people the space, time and privacy to engage with religion online. This can be seen with the growth of the Alpha course, but also with TikTok conversions. There's still so much to be discovered about the impact and potential of TikTok to evangelize. I hope I can find some of this out, but for now, I'm going to enjoy watching things like hashtag nuntalk. We have time for one question. Sorry, Susie. AC. I'm sorry. But, but yeah, if anyone has questions for Susie, please find her at the break as well, because it's super fascinating research. But. Hi, um, very interesting. Um, I have a potentially very odd and very ignorant question. Um, I don't have TikTok, but I used to have Instagram. And every now and then I would end up on these videos of, um, because I follow a lot of like planting and farming stuff. Yeah of um, kind of Christian homemakers that are kind of breaching into this area of um, sustainability and being self-sufficient. And I wonder if what your opinion is, whether that those kind of overlaps of topics could actually um, influence some people to move from one of those areas, so from a kind of sustainability, self-sufficiency point into religion. Yeah. So. Thank you. <laughs> really good question. I think, um, I feel someone today was talking about hashtags. I feel like hashtags become very important in this context because um, when you put out a reel or a TikTok, you'll put hashtags underneath it because um, that hashtag will relate that video to other videos with a hashtag. Um, and what that means is it, people very rarely put one hashtag. They also, they might put Christian TikTok, but also, I don't know, Hashtag American football is something I've seen in the same TikTok before. Um, and you're completely right, because people who are following hashtag American football will also then be shown the Christian TikTok thing and can get led down that stream. And I think that's very interesting, you know, in the context of the TikTok algorithm, which takes account of the fact that you've watched that content, and then it will keep showing it back to you. So very good question and very true and relevant. Okay, sorry. Thank you.